All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Entonces, vamos a empezar. Let me Let just, me just uh, read, read this statement. statement. You read every single meeting. Before we begin, I want to remind the Public Safety Finance and Strategic Support Committee members and the members of the public to follow our code of conduct at meetings. This includes commenting on the specific agenda item only and addressing the full body. Public speakers will not engage in a conversation with the chair, council members or staff. All members of the Public Safety Committee, staff and the public are expected to refrain from abusive language. Repeated failure to comply with the code of conduct, which will disturb, disrupt, or impede the orderly conduct of this meeting, may result in removal from the meeting. This meeting, the Public Safety Finance and Strategic Support Committee will now come to order. And can the clerk please call the roll? Batra? Present. Torres? Present. Kame? Duan? Present. And Jimenez? Present. Thank you, Chair. All right, thank you. We'll move on to the uh, review of the work plan. I don't see anything listed there, so do we need to take, remind me, take public comment on that? No, right? Okay, yeah. All right, we're going to go to item C, consent calendar. We have a few items there. We have the bi-monthly financial report for January, February 2024. Uh, actually, just that item. Um, we have any public comment on the consent calendar? No public comment. Okay, we'll go ahead and entertain a motion to move to accept. Okay, motion in a second. Okay, we'll go ahead and vote. Unanimous for the folks that are here. Okay, motion passes. Wonderful. Thank you, we'll move on to report to the committee. Uh, up first is the Fire Department Operations Annual Report. I think we have uh, Chief Sapien. Uh, Assistant Chief Williams and Fire Captain Ryan West. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, we're going to go ahead and move you guys over, I believe. Yes, please. All right, thank you. Thank you. Go ahead and start whenever you guys are ready. Good afternoon, Chairperson Jimenez, committee members and members of the public. My name is Ryan West. I'm a fire captain with San Jose Fire Department. I'm here today with Fire Chief Robert Sapien and Assistant Chief James Williams. We'll be presenting item D1, the fire department's annual operations report with a focus on call volume and emergency response time performance. As you know, San Jose is the 12th largest city in the United States, serving close to 1 million residents sprawling across over 200 square miles. San Jose Fire Department is committed to serving every person in this community by protecting life, property, and the environment. We do this through prevention and response. San Jose Fire Department is a high volume, all hazards fire department. We not only provide fire suppression and rescue services, but we also provide advanced life support, emergency medicine, and specialized emergency response that include urban search and rescue, aircraft rescue firefighting, and hazardous incident mitigation. This annual report will begin by looking at the department's call volume followed by emergency response times. <clears throat> they will each contain analysis of the statistics, the trends, and the key contributing factors. This report will also include the status of the response time work plan presented it to the committee back in June of 2014. San Jose Fire Department is one of the biggest, busiest fire departments in the nation. We respond to well over 100,000 service calls a year. Our protection area includes residential, commercial, wildland, urban interface, and part of San, Jose Bay, San Francisco Bayfront. We also protect target hazard areas such as San Jose Moneta International Airport, the SAP Center, PayPal Park, San Jose State University, three super regional malls, seven major hospitals, and 108 high-rise structures. In the past 10 years, San Jose Fire Department's call volume has increased over 40%. Next slide. 
This slide shows data comparing call volume with city population for the last five fiscal years. You'll see that the city population has decreased over 8%, but the fire department's call volume has increased nearly 19%. Prior to 2018, you would have seen a direct correlation of rising call volume with rising population. This trend has changed. <clears throat> like most fire departments, our highest call volume is in the core of the city, represented here, Battalion 1, in red, being our centrally located downtown fire stations. During high volume call periods, resources from surrounding battalions are drawn into Battalion 1 to assist with emergency response. This variability in population density and service demands impact the emergency response coverage. In this graph, we're showing call volume per fire station response area. The busiest fire station within each battalion is noted with their call volume. Battalion one is shown in the red to the far left. To give you perspective on the sheer level of call volume Battalion 1 experiences, you'll note that Station 26 was 6,247 calls per year. Engine 26 is consistently rated the top 15 busiest fire engines in the entire nation. You will see there are several fire stations on this graph that respond to similar call volume. It is important to note that this graph shows the number of incidents only, not the number of resources deployed to mitigate the emergency. A single incident may require a single resource or can have several resources responding to the single incident, including multiple alarms that could involve well over 10 different companies. As such, the incident response numbers provided in this report only partially represent the workloads for each fire station. <clears throat> we'll get one more. In previous slides, you might have noted there were only five battalions listed. Due to our most recent investment in fiscal year 2023-24, San Jose Fire Department added a sixth battalion. This geographical map shows our new configuration with the department's sixth battalion. Data from this battalion will be reflected in future reports. This is, a heat, this is a heat map showing the call volume intensity ranging from the lowest in blue and the highest call volume in red. High call volume, which is centralized in the core of San Jose, negatively impacts the department's response time performance. This is due to high call volume reducing the resources available, thus increasing travel time to reach the incident from the neighboring stations. This pie chart shows the distrib distribution of the fire department's 109,000 incidents received during the fiscal year of 2022-23. The department experienced no significant marked increase in the medical call percentage, and there was no remarkable change in call type distribution. This slide reflects static EMS call volume from the past five fiscal years. You'll see fiscal year 2021-22, there was an increase of 10.5% in the EMS calls and another 6.5% increase in fiscal year 2022-23. This bar graph provides emergency medical response distribution across patient age groups. California Department on Aging projects that residents of 65 years and older will double by 2030, and residents 85 years and older will increase over 84%. This is important to note because in fiscal year 2022 and 23, our patient age data shows 55% of our medical calls were for individuals that were 60 years or older, and 67% were 50 years and older. As quoted from the California State Plan on Aging, those individuals that are 85 years or older having a significantly higher rate of severe chronic health conditions and functional limitations that result in the need for more health and supportive care, which can contribute to an increased call volume. The department's data shows calls involving seniors were spread relatively evenly throughout the valley. This next segment will focus on the department's current response times. Our performance improvement projects, and strategies that are all part of the response time work plan. San Jose Fire Department response times are measured against two performance standards, the City of San Jose and Santa Clara County EMS. The City of San Jose has a response time performance standard for both fires and medical services to arrive at the incident within eight minutes, 80% 80 of the time for priority one calls, traveling with lights and sirens and 13 minutes, 80% of the time, for priority two calls, traveling without lights and sirens. 
The highlighted section shows the three segments that make up the overall response time. These are the alarm processing time, turnout time, and travel time. The alarm processing time begins when a 911 call is received by Fire Communication Center and ends when the available resources are dispatched to the incident. This has a target of two minutes. The turnout time segment starts with the dispatching of resources needed to mitigate the incident and ends when the unit starts to travel towards the emergency. This also has a target of two minutes. The travel time segment starts when the vehicle starts traveling towards the incident and ends upon arrival at the incident. Priority one emergencies have a target of four minutes and nine minutes for priority two emergencies. As a county, con as a county contracted ALS provider, response time performance standard for the county includes the highlighted sections, turnout time and travel time. Their response time standard begins upon dispatch of resources and stops upon arrival of the incident address. Santa Clara County EMS contract provision focuses on medical emergencies only. Their response time performance standard require arrival on scene of a priority one emergency within eight minutes, 90% of the time in urban areas, and for priority two emergencies within 13 minutes, 90% of the time. This slide shows the department's response time performance for fiscal year 2022-23. The city's response time performance standard of eight minutes for priority one emergencies was met on an average of 66.38% of the time. This is 13.62 basis points below the city standard. This is shown in blue on the graph. The, country, the county standard was met 88.17% of the time. This is 1.83% basis points below the county standard, and this is shown in orange. The department's agreement with the county includes exemptions for response time performance requirements. After this fiscal year's exemptions, San Jose Fire Department met the county's response time performance standard in all 12 months. Travel time is still the department's principal challenge to on-time response performance. The distance between fire stations, unit out of service time, traffic congestion, and high call volume each play a role in challenging travel time performance. As an ongoing effort to decrease the distance between fire stations and to increase resourcing, the city is continuing to advance new fire station building projects enabled by Measure T. In March of 2022, the newly located Fire Station 20 expanded the fire department's coverage to surrounding residential and business community. Additionally, in May of 2022, Fire Station 37 completed construction and became fully operational to strengthen fire protection coverage and improve response time performance. The department has also worked to minimize out of service time by utilizing overtime to conduct training and other administrative details. This heat map that you're looking at now shows travel times greater than four minutes. Red areas indicate the greatest number of late responses and the green areas indicate the lowest number of late responses. Although fire stations are closely together in the core of the city, the higher number of incidents result in an increased number of late responses as previously explained. In fiscal year 2022-23, the department responded to over 109,000 incidents. This is an increase of 5.8% from the year prior, an increase of 18.7% over the past five years, and a 40% increase in call volume in the last 10 years. In May of 2022, the department opened the new fire station 37. This is now the same number of operating fire stations we had in fiscal year 2009 and 2010, 12 years earlier. Leveraging funding from the Measure T bond will enable construction of new fire stations 32 and fire station 36, as well as the relocation of fire station 8 and fire station 23. Measure T also provided funding for the improvement of the 911 call center's capacity and improve integration of modern technologies to meet volume demands and support emergency 911 features. The department continues to advance multiple response time improvement strategies included in the response time work plan. This slide shows an example of business intelligence tools used to provide reports and user interfaces that direct organizational focus on performance driven by actionable data. Here is a list of key strategies and process that are focused towards improving travel time. 
Resourcing projects include deployment refinements with real-time move-ups and backfill training, fire communication staffing improvements, and dropping borders. Technology products include CAD to CAD dispatching links, closest unit dispatching, and increasing navigational technology. We'll continue to use analytics to include new data collected to help direct the department's focus on decreasing overall response times. That concludes the fire department's operations annual report. We are here to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're going to go to see if we have public comment. There is no public comment. So no public comment. We'll bring it back to the um, to the committee. Let's first go with uh, Councilmember Duan. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Fire Department, for your incredible work, and, and thank you for the report. Chief, I, I wonder um, when are we looking to open up, uh, reopen uh, Fire Station 33? Thank you for the question, Council Member. Uh, so, yes, Fire Station 33 uh, was closed uh, during the recession uh, due to budget action. Uh, as we've moved forward to improve response time performance across the city, uh, where we have prioritized uh, deployment action has been where our performance is the worst. Uh, our last assessment uh, of Fire Station 33's area is that it is responsible for less than 0.5% uh, uh, of late responses, and so it's still not a high priority. The, the main uh, activity that we're uh, looking towards is the completion of a roadway from Communications Hill uh, down to Kirtner. That would require a crossing uh, over tracks, um, and I know that's a project uh, in queue. I'm not sure of the, of the timeline yet. But that will uh, make Station 33 vital in terms of improving response time performance in that area. So I believe that that, that should be complete in And, and I know that because of the geographical of the first due of the fire engine, fire truck, it causes that delay. Am I correct on that? So, so the primary driver for late responses is distance. In other words, if there were no activity across the city at all and a call came in, outside of a station's four minute response area. That's, a, that's a, a heavy driver for why we can't meet our response times yet. So I, I believe somewhere, hopefully in, in, in the near future that we would uh, look at plan of having more station to reduce that geographical area so that way we can respond you know, within the, the, the time limit. Uh, yes, Council Member, when we put forth our recommendation for placement of stations that would be funded by Measure T, uh, I believe, if I recall correctly, uh, I may have listed up to 10 stations, trying to identify those areas where we might close gaps. Obviously, Measure T funds won't reach that far, but we, we do have our eyes uh, focused on, on where performance needs to be improved. Yes, uh, somewhere I believe we'll... we'll trying to figure out possible another bond to, to finish out the, the other um, six or seven station, if you will. And then on the response time, how much money do we lost when we have to pay the county the fines? So thank you for that question. Uh, so yes, under the, the agreement with the county, um, we have a provision in that agreement that is a performance requirement. Um, and as Captain West described, uh, we're required to respond uh, once notified of a call uh, within eight minutes. Uh, if we do not meet a 95% threshold, uh, we uh, experience some liquidated, liquidated damages in that agreement. And if we do not meet 90%, we could be deemed in breach of contract and have, uh, you know, be, be at risk of not receiving any first responder funds at all. I understand that, and, and what I'm asking is, is each year, since we did not meet the, the county standard, how much money have we lost? Because every dollar counts, right? For let's say just mm -hmm. fiscal year 2023, or, and what is the, the, the amount of money that we, we have to? 
annually i think i would put it at two million or less that we're exposed to there's there's a few variables in terms of what penalties were receiving and why i should note to to the committee that given the recent challenges with getting ambulances on scene in future reports we're going to we're going to note diminished service overall and diminished to the level that i don't think exemptions will cover the gap meaning we may be at risk of not meeting 90 percent i am highly confident that as we analyze data it's going to be directly related to instances where our resources either our ambulance resources had to either transport patients or our paramedics had to escort patients to emergency rooms leaving areas uncovered with als resources and so i think in 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 the coming year that very question of the entire uh, amount available for 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 fees or, or possibly at risk. Thank you. And we're we're working towards making City of San Jose is the AI hub. And I wonder, are you looking to any program like I know that the drones program has helped us rescue people out of the rivers. If we would have the drone program back in 2017, when we had the flood or any major disaster, would that would that help our department um, to be more um, visually to, to help us to be more efficient or at least more effective in, in um, rescuing and, and protecting lives and uh, properties? Yeah, thank you for the question. I, I think what we're seeing across the industry is the use of robotics and particularly drones. Uh, are highly effective. Uh, they can be deployed rapidly. Uh, they do not, in, in many cases, we can put them in, in areas where we don't, in lieu of putting humans in, in harm's way. Uh, the drones in particular offer very rapid uh, surveillance uh, and we have tools uh, such as FLIR technology that helps us um, look for hotspots and that sort of thing. So absolutely an emerging technology that we'll be using more and more over time. Uh, thank you, and, and and I know that uh, we can use it in confined space or hazmat situation, or um, prior to our firefighter get in, you know, get on their turnout and get on the rigs and the travel time. Sometime we can use that technology to to move ahead to give us the, the intel prior to getting to the incident. Uh, thank you for uh, your hard work, and I appreciate um, our brother and sister working hard out there and. Um, that's all I have, and I move to accept the report. Second. Thank you. Chair, if, if you don't mind, I did get uh, actual numbers on the liquidated. I saw you texting. I was wondering. Uh, li liquidated. Yeah, I wasn't uh, playing a game over here. <laughs> uh, liquidated damages for, um, for uh, fiscal year 22-23 uh, were 430700 hmm. and the total possible possible amount, 3.6 million. Thank you. Well, hopefully someday we can meet all that timeline and use that money to reopen um, station 33 or use that money to open another station. Thank you. And, and you know, we ask a lot of questions up here, whether it be during the meetings, the, the council meetings, or even to the committee meetings. So I always feel comfortable for anyone here. You can phone a friend. You can reach out to someone. Thank <laughs> so you. So we realize that you don't always have you don't always have all the information at hand. So it's a, I appreciate it. And I figured that's what you were doing. I was thinking he's getting the number. I knew it. Uh, so we'll, we'll go to Councilman Rabatra, please. Let me turn it on here. Technology. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, detailed report. And uh, I do have a couple of questions on clarification when you give those call volumes does that include when you share your or what do you call that mutual agreement you provide services to other cities than san jose thank you for the question usually how we handle mutual aid is we will count incidents in our area um, and uh, incidents outside of the area will be counted in their data. Uh, the exchange right now from auto aid agreements, which are the most frequent where 
for example i think two good council districts to think about are our district one and district nine where we share borders with santa clara county fire department in district one fire station 14 we share resources quite a bit with county so engine 14 goes to county on quite a few responses and also in station nine's area in district nine santa clara county covers our area in cambrian about an equal amount and so the balance of calls is is about even i think in the range of seven thousand or so okay so for all practical purposes these calls are san jose calls then all the numbers which you mentioned right right okay and 63 or 65 percent of your calls related to the medical but the response which we send whether it's a fire call or medical call is the same same amount of the resources the truck and the same same kind of truck and same number of people on uh, it uh, no as 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 Captain West reported, that's one of our, our confounders for workload. Um, so for example, um, most recently, the, the very large Home Depot fire that we had and going further back, the Santana Row fire, those each count as one, right? So in, in reality, we sent far more resources to each of those. And so call volume, I think, is a, is a, a good measure of community demand uh, but it does not necessarily measure the scope of work that, that we were called upon to achieve. Okay, all right, uh, thank you very much. On that, the, I'm glad that you were able to make use of the Measure T funds in a very meaningful way. Uh, you know I have special affinity to that mm -hmm. one uh, for good reasons. And even though this is a, your 23 report, annual report for the year 23, I was, would want to congratulate you on your 24 achievement of getting that uh, training center built. Uh, and that's extremely impressive and very useful, which is uh, going to help improve everything we do with the fire. And that's a real pride, and I'm trying to spread the word that more people visit you and creating some workload for you, but uh, I'm trying to send all the people from my district to go and visit that and be as impressed as I was. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a facility that, that I think to a person in our organization we're, we're very proud of uh, and we will make very good use of and, and of course, very appreciative for uh, this new facility. Yes, okay, all right, thank you. I don't see anyone else. I just have two questions. One is related to slide five, and, and uh, it's a slide that shows the increased amount of calls with the decreased population, decreasing population. I'm trying to, I mean, I, I think maybe have some ideas, but I'm wondering if you've thought through why that is. Is it the aging population? Is it why that, you would think they would probably drop given the population's dropping, but it's not. Yeah, thank you, council member. I, I don't have full analysis. I do have some anecdotal um, opinions from from uh, professionals in, in our region um, one um, theory is that there uh, post COVID have been fewer private ambulances doing interfacility transport and we have seen uh, a bit of a bump in, in going to care facilities uh, where before maybe they would use a phone call to get interfacility transport now maybe they're calling 911 more frequently um, Certainly, uh, it, it appears um, that for whatever reason, um, COVID seems to be an inflection point for increased call volume, and whether it's um, uh, folks e accessing medical care in that way, maybe as a shift in terms of, of how we all existed in, in, during COVID and during the lockdown, that may be an influence. Um, and then ultimately, I think uh, drivers like what we've been monitoring relative to population age. Um, we're certainly going to be parsing that data out to try to understand it more. Okay. And do you do you find that other departments, other cities are experiencing something similar, assuming they have populations decreasing, the calls remain the same or increasing? Is My peers across the county uh, are reporting increase in calls uh, okay. as well. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. The the other uh, question I had is related to slide 17. 
it's talk, it shows a little bit about the county EMS code three compliance, 90% standard, and then it shows the city priority one compliance, 80% standard. What comes to mind is I, I think in not, I don't know if it's next week or the week after to the council, you're bringing forward something that came through this committee, uh, the evaluation as to whether you all or we as a city are gonna go for the, uh, that, that contract with the county and, and you brought forward, I think, different models. Can you refresh my memory as to what, I have a question tied to that, but. Yes, thank you, council member. So yes, the, the department continues to evaluate uh, the possibility for us to become, uh, in one model, a bidder to the county's RFP for transport services countywide. Um, that is still exploratory at this time, but right. it does, it, it is a model that is working very effectively in other jurisdictions, and so it, it has, I think, very strong possibilities. Um, and then uh, another, um, I, I think, sort of countywide uh, discussion amongst fire chiefs is um, if, if there is a, a complete failure of ambulance service, what do we have in terms of fire department resources to try to be the safety net? That conversation continues as well. Right. Uh, but uh, yeah. and, and, the, and then with regard to the model that you mentioned uh, mm -hmm. first, uh, tell me if I'm remembering correctly, but the, the, the idea, one potential model would be that we would um, submit a bid to get that contract with the county and then we would then hire the the EMS under that and then manage that is that is that, that one of, that's one the, of the structure it would, it would probably work in reverse where we would come to terms with a private provider first first okay. and then right. if we met if we if we felt we could meet the requirements of a county RFP and we could do it in a way that that made good business sense, okay. then we would be a bidder. Yeah. Okay, and I think you sort of answered my question, but the, where I was going with this is what I was curious about. I didn't, I was thinking of it the reverse way that we would get the contract and then hire the, the provider. Um, but what I was curious about is if, if we went down the road and getting that model, would these standards change? Would this 90%, I mean, or these are county standards, right? And so these aren't, I mean, I'm just trying to think of how this how this would change the response time performance metrics and how we measure it, if it would change at all, if we went with a different model, I guess. Yeah, I think the best reference for me would be uh, what we're seeing in Contra Costa County, which uh, with the, the Contra Costa County Fire Department having oversight of the private provider uh, and their resources, uh, what they're able to do is use revenues to reinvest in the system and what they're able to do is add unit hours. So if they're not satisfied with ambulance system performance, the fire department can decide, you know, we'd like you to, we'd like you private company to add more hours and improve your response times. And so I, I think the, the advantage that, that I see in that process is that any revenues that come into the transport service remain in this system here in this county. And help facilitate the increased response time. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Th that's all I had. Any other questions? Okay. We'll go ahead and vote. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. All right. It's unanimous. Thank you so much for your time. We'll move on to our next item, which is item two, public safety city service area performance measure status report. Um, we have a few folks uh, joining us. I'm not going to go through the whole list, but if you can make your way down, that'd be great. Good afternoon. Hello, Chair Jimenez, members of the committee and members of the public. I'm Jennifer Piozze, a senior executive analyst with the city manager's office leading the public safety city service area performance management modernization project. That is a lot of words. Um, I'm joined here today in the box um, by Claudia Chang, who's the deputy director of the city manager's budget office, as well as my colleagues from the public safety CSA um, partners who are in the audience today. This initiative is aligned with one of the city manager's foundational strategic support focus areas called driving organizational performance. The project's goal was to improve the meaningfulness of the way we measure the outcomes and performance of the CSA 
and was done in partnership with all of the public safety CSA partners, including fire, police, Office of Emergency Management, and the Independent Police Auditor. So today, we'll provide, I'll provide an update on the modernization of the performance measures, where we're at with these draft measures for the city service area, including our approach, the components of the update, snapshots of the changes, and a summary of the updates to the mission, outcomes, strategic goals, performance metrics, as well as the addition of community indicators, which are new in the budget book. So performance management in local government is a powerful tool for impact and storytelling, particularly around program success and resourcing. The Public Safety CSA has eight core services that are mapped to four departments and offices. Within those core services that are on the screen, there are 41 budget programs that detail the service delivery work. On this slide, we wanted to show the scale of staffing for the city among the six city service areas, of which Public Safety CSA is the largest in terms of the number of budgeted full-time staff within the departments. The performance modernization is meant to demonstrate accountability and responsible resource stewardship for the public resources that we invest into this CSA. For the modernization project, we aim to systematically align qualitative and quantitative elements within the CSA structure to monitor and evaluate services in four steps. The first step, we assess the existing CSA mission, outcomes, and strategic goals and proposed an update. These draft updates were then used to guide the creation of community indicators, which was in step two, and proposed new and updated CSA and core service performance measures, an update update or new CSA activity and workload highlights at the core service level. So we'll talk a little bit about the CSA structure. So each CSA has a mission, outcome, strategic goals, and core services. And we had the pleasure of updating these uh, this last year for neighborhood services, and now we're working on public safety and um, community and economic development. These strategic goals and core services are the qualitative representations which we quantify the CSA's performance and performance me through performance measures and quantify the departmental performance and at the core service level with department specific performance measures and activity and workload highlights. Performance measures at the CSA and core service level measure just how well we did something and activity and workload highlights at the core service level measure how much of something that we did. So it's a measurement of scale or output. New this year are community indicators, which measure what impact we have on the community, and they can be disaggregated in some manner, usually by race or ethnicity or geographical location. The city may not be wholly responsible for the success of a community indicator, something like high school graduation rates, but we do play a part in its success. The hope is that these updated tools will more accurately measure the success of the department's service delivery and create tools to have more informed decisions about service delivery, celebrate those successes, and identify any resource gaps, whether they be things like staffing or budget, and how they can be addressed. Ultimately, we want to move the organization from doing performance measurement into performance management, whereby we use these tools in storytelling and to guide changes in program delivery and resource allocation. When we were workshopping these metrics with the departments, we provided these criteria for how to create good measure measures. We asked them to consider the frequency of measure collection and reporting, and if it meets our needs for annual collection or greater reporting timeframes. We asked them to consider equity, and if the measure can be disaggregated in any manner, like race or ethnicity or geographical location, to name a few. We asked them to consider the credibility of the measure, like if it's used as a benchmark by other cities, if it's an industry standard, or if the methodology is sound. We asked them to consider the scope of the measure, and if it captures the scales, context, and represents the populations impacted by their service delivery. And we asked them to consider the relevancy of the measure, and if it aligns to our organizational or community goals. 
even with the addition of community indicators and the increase in the overall number of CSA performance measures that we report on, we've decreased the number of course service performance measures and activity and workload highlights in the budget books, book, which allows staff to focus on reporting and using resource storytelling on the most important metrics to the city and other stakeholders. Based upon department leadership and staff feedback, these are the proposed draft updates to the mission, outcomes, and strategic goals for the Public Safety CSA. So the updated mission reads as, engage the community to partner on public safety and emergency prevention, mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery. This is supported by two outcomes, the first of which is a safer San Jose with effective emergency response services and the second is resilient communities that are prepared for emergencies. And beneath these outcomes, we ha they each have three strategic goals that explain our role or showcase our role as a city to fulfilling the outcomes in the mission. These new community indicators are the measurement that quantifies trends affecting outcomes and show the overall well-being of our community. These can be represented as a number, a rate, or a percentage, and are able to be disaggregated by race or ethnicity, geographical location, or other categories. I'll read some examples. So under outcome one, we have indicators that report things like crime types and public survey data around San Jose, asking if the, the public considered a safe place to live. And under outcome two, we have indicators around the registration of the public for our emergency alert system, or alert SCC. The updated CSA performance measures describe, again, how well a group of core services are meeting in our objective, typically a rate or percentage. Examples here include fire emergency responsiveness or motor vehicle collisions for outcome one. And under outcome two, we have an example of the community emergency response team certificates or CERT. We've included the independent police auditor as a separate appointee in the project because they are a critical core service within the public safety CSA. We included their core service performance metrics to provide transparency and impact on their work within the organization. Example metrics include the number of internal affairs investigation interviews that are attended by IPA staff and the number of policy recommendations made to and accepted by the chief of police. The attachment to the memo has the remainder of the performance measures and activity and workload highlights for police, fire, and the Office of Emergency Management for the committee to reference and review. And so our recommendation is to accept the status report on the performance modernization updates for the public safety CSA, including the updated mission, outcomes, strategic goals, and updated community indicators, as well as the draft performance measures and activity and workload highlights. I do want to note a couple next steps. So the budget office is set to publish the updated mission, outcomes, strategic goals, and performance metrics in the upcoming operating budget. The public safety CSA partners uh, will share performance metrics during upcoming, upcoming budget study sessions. And we do have some future scope worth mentioning. The city manager's office is partnering with information technology department to create CSA dashboards that would be available online to display our, dash, our performance measures. And we're also partnering with um, our IT department to create a data catalog where the measures will be stored and could be interactive um, for staff. But this project is uh, dependent upon the appropriation of resources in a future budget cycle to be completed. And I would be remiss not to highlight many of the wonderful staff that worked with us uh, to undertake this modernization effort. Many of them are in the audience today, including Claudia sitting next to me um, from the budget office. And so we'd like to thank our partners in the budget office, the information technology department, the office of emergency management, the independent police auditor, the fire department, and the police department. So many, many thanks for your tireless efforts and your valuable insights. And with that, this concludes our presentation. Thank you for the presentation. We'll see if there's any public comment. There is no public comment. Okay, 
no public comment. I don't know if there's any, I don't see any hands lit. Oh, actually, Council Member Dwan. Um, just move for acceptance of the report. There's a motion to accept, okay, a second, okay. Um, seeing no questions, I'll just ask a question. So, can, can you help me understand, so there's, there's a lot of information in here, obviously we got all the slides. Um, how much, what parts of this are public facing, if any? Like if, like member of a public, I want to, what's a CSA area, I want to go in and poke around the website. What, what would I see as it relates to the slides that you have up? Any of this presented in this exact way or how? Uh, thank you for your question. All the performance measures are, um, you can find a link at the city manager's budget office for any particular year. And so since these measures are gonna be new for fiscal year 24-25, when we release the budget, you can find all the information there, not just for this CSA, but for all CSAs. And then if you wanna drill down further, you can look in the department sections as well, because there's more measures there. Yeah, okay, all right, thank you. Um, th the reason I ask is, you know, as I was looking through the slides, I, yeah, there's a lot of information in here. <laughs> Um, and, and to be honest, I'll be vulnerable as I say this. As I'm going through it, sometimes I'm like, hold on, what is, where does this go or what does this mean? And so it gets, it's a little confusing. As an example, as an example, I'll just point something out. Um, it just feels a little clunky, but let me just, um, so say for example, slide uh, 10, I think. You go to, it says CSA performance measures by outcome and then outcome one. Actually, yeah, if you could put it on the screen, that'd be great. It says outcome one a safer San Jose with effective emergency response services and then performance managers. And then just as I read this, right, and I imagine someone that isn't used to seeing these reports would probably feel even more overwhelmed. But as I'm looking through this, if you look at, say, if you go down the list of the performance measures, 1.1.1 quality of fire protection, and then, you know, just all the numbers, just, I feel like there's just a lot of information there and, and it sort of distracts from the, and so I, I just wanted to give constructive feedback as it relates to just, if we're expecting or hope that the residents are consuming this and make sense of this, I think it probably needs to be a little bit more basic, um, even for us. <laughs> oh, so if, I can, if I can jump in, I don't think you need to feel vulnerable. Uh, I think it took all of us a little while to really get our arms wrapped around some of these definitions, yeah. modernize them from what they used to be intended for, and then what we need to use them for. So I, I think a few things, you know, Jennifer mentioned um, partnering with information technology department to kind of have these more forward facing, not needing our residents to dive uh, into the budget book, although I'm, I'm sure some of our residents would love to do that. Um, I think as part of that, we can be better around some of the definitions and what's intended. And I think we want to do that separately because the outfacing ones, just as like we do with the scorecards, should be a bit more user friendly. And I think because we're modern, modernizing this, Claudia, maybe we should have Jim as part of the budget study session kickoff this year, go over a sample slide because what this is meant to do with modernizing is really help facilitate our conversations with you and, and you amongst yourself on the why something might be happening and then what we need to do in the budget or programmatically to address those things and how to go about it. So that, that's what it's really intended for and I think we can be more purposeful in the study sessions about outlining it so that everyone's on the same page and not um, confused or overwhelmed by it because I, I know it's taken us a while to not be overwhelmed with it as well, council member. Yeah, yeah. and if, uh, I don't know if other, uh, I'll go to uh, Vice Mayor Kamei, but th that was just my questions. But I appreciate the information. Obviously, a lot of smart people like yourselves in the city produce this. There's a lot going on here. And um, yeah, so thank you for that. Appreciate it. Vice Mayor Kamei. Thank you so much. And, and thank you for everyone who worked on it. This can get a little bit, um, clunky and uncomfortable. And yes, in fact, there are a lot of like uh, different points as you move along. But as you look at uh, performance measures and look at indicators, you know, you can't only slice out one year. This is gonna be helpful over time to see what are the trends? What is happening? Are we on target? If we set a performance metric, are we meeting it? Is it going up? Is it going down? I think that it's gonna be much more valuable in years to come. Uh, it, it is a little clunky, there's a lot of stuff, and uh, it could be uh, 
uh, uh, difficult at first, but I think that it's certainly very worthwhile. And I think that as we move forward, you also tweak it a little bit to get better. Maybe you didn't get that metric right the first time, uh, but, but certainly it's something to follow along. And I think that that will uh, help us uh, much more in the, in the future. So thank you for everyone who came together and, and did this work. I think there was, was there a, mo there was a motion, right? Yes. Okay, all right, and I don't see any more, any more uh, hands raised, so we'll go ahead and vote. Okay, it's unanimous. Thank you so much for the report, appreciate it. We'll move on to uh, item number three, cannabis regulation of the tobacco retailer status report. And then we have Wendy and, and Rachel, I assume is here, and a few other folks. Whenever you guys are ready. Good afternoon, Chair Jimenez, co committee members, and members of the public. My name is Wendy Salazi, and I'm the division manager in the Police Department's Division of Cannabis Regulation. With me today is Deputy Chief Brian Schab and Rachel Roberts, Deputy Director of Code Enforcement. Based on the Public Safety, Finance, and Strategic Support Committee's direction on October 19th, staff is providing an update on the possibility of expanding the scope of the Division of Cannabis Regulation to include vape and smoke shops. Oops, sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Staff has received reports from various stakeholders regarding concerns about illegal products being sold, such as cannabis, cannabis-adjacent or cannabis-like products, mushrooms, and other substances at vape and smoke shops or other businesses throughout the city. Code enforcement staff has observed some of these products being offered for sale in some tobacco retail licensed businesses and has received several complaints reporting illegal cannabis products for sale at smoke shops. Also recently, the Division of Cannabis Regulation staff referred a report of a tobacco retail licensed business selling cannabis to a minor um, to our enforcement unit within the police department for further investigation and enforcement. As an involving issue that requires multiple city department efforts, it is important that staff consider the scope of the problem, enforcement tools and resources already in place, constraints and additional enforcement tools and resources that may be required to implement a successful strategy to address vape and smoke shops. The Division of Cannabis Regulation is responsible for performing the day-to-day -day regulation of the registered cannabis businesses, including conducting inspections and taking civil action against businesses if they're not in compliance with the cannabis program regulations. As currently structured, the division staff is entirely funded by, uh, through fees that allow for full cost recovery. This means that staff are unable to perform tasks not associated with the cannabis regulatory program unless either there's general fund resources were made available or new cost recovery fees were imposed to pay for such tasks. Um, similarly, the Code Enforcement Division is also fee funded as it relates to enforcement of these particular areas. Uh, code Enforcement is responsible for conducting both proactive inspections and enforcement as well as responding to complaints for cannabis businesses, tobacco retail licensed businesses, and other private property concerns to ensure compliance with cannabis and TRL Muni code regulations. Proactive enforcement efforts include the annual inspections of both the registered cannabis businesses and the uh, tobacco retail license businesses, and also youth, youth decoy operations to ensure businesses are operating in accordance with the regulations. Code staff also responds to complaints from the public involving cannabis, such as illegally operating cannabis businesses, odor, or personal cult cultivation as well as um, complaints regarding any TRL businesses that may involve um, um, unpermitted activity at vape and smoke shops. 
So some current resources uh, available to the city um, in addition to our um, regular staffing and funding is um, the State Department of Justice grant. Um, this is um, was administered by the County of Santa Clara Public Health Department and awarded to Code Enforcement for Enforcement of Tobacco Regulations. Um, as noticed, we work in partnership with the Santa Clara County um, on this effort and um, they assisted us in reestablishing the youth decoy program to enforce laws prohibiting the sale of tobacco products to minors. Um, in fiscal year 22-23, we conducted 92 decoy operations resulting in 20 citations. Um, and while this youth decoy program is currently on hold um, due to a lack of available decoys, we are looking at alternatives such as partnering with the police department's Explore Cadet program to, con to continue to conduct decoy operations. We're also looking at efforts to revoke license um, for any re repeat offenders of sales to minors. I think this slide is a repeat slide that you've seen probably a few times this year. But again, I think it's important for uh, the public to be aware of where, where they should file their complaints or concerns if they see something um, happening with illegal sale of cannabis, mushroom, fentanyl, any other illegal substances. So on our slide here, we have um, websites uh, to, to um, email addresses, websites, phone numbers. Uh, for anything that they see for illegal activity. And then if there are complaints about the registered cannabis businesses, we have our contact information on here as well. Um, so for code enforcement, um, should a member of the public have concerns about unpermitted cannabis activities, um, a vape and smoke shop, tobacco retail uses, or any other administrative municipal code violation concerns, um, they can report their concerns to code enforcement um, through several ways, um, one of which is going to our website. There's a link for a service request, and they can file a complaint through that link. Um, they can also call our main number Monday through Friday, 8 to 5, and there's actually a staff, a team of staff that will um, answer those calls in, in real time and take those complaints. Um, and then we also have a, a code complaint email uh, box that is um, actively monitored for any complaints that may come through as an email service request. Um, and just to note that all complaining party information does remain confidential, and so we always encourage folks to, to come forward and report any concerns they may have. I think there's a, an important partner that we have in the state of California. They have an enforcement division that specifically uh, investigates complaints for unlicensed or illegal cannabis activity. Uh, their goal is to stop the sale of cannabis to minors, and they want to prevent unsafe products from entering the cannabis market. So we strongly encourage um, any complaints to be filed here as well. Um, the state did just announce in the first quarter they had a significant um, or a successful first quarter of, um, of combating the illicit market. And so we'd like to see them if there are a lot of complaints in our city and county. Um, this is where you file those, and so then um, the state can focus on our area as well. And then here is the Office of Youth Tobacco Enforcement, and there's a website there and email and phone numbers for the public to contact as well if they have uh, concerns. Um, again, uh, just as a reminder, our staff is entirely funded through the Canvas program fees, so if there are um, tasks that City Council would like for us to perform that are not associated with cannabis regulatory program. There needs to be uh, general fund resources made available or a new cost recovery fees to be imp uh, imposed to pay for tasks. Uh, additionally, on March 19th, the City Council directed staff to significantly reduce our cannabis regulatory fees next year. So the reduction in fees will have significant staffing reductions. Um, expanding the scope of our division to include regulation of vape and smoke shops will require a new funding source and staffing to perform associated activities. So one area where we do believe there could be a possible opportunity um, would, with um, regards to regulation of these types of establishments would be um, 
uh, doing an amendment to the Title 20 of the San Jose Municipal Code to um, add a requirement for a conditional use permit. Um, it would establish or would define um, and establish vape and smoke shops as enumerated use within the land use tables for zoning districts and re would require that a use permit be obtained in order to operate. Um, by establishing this permit requirement, it would allow the city to condition the, the use to ensure vape and smoke shop businesses are operating in a manner uh, that does not adversely affect the community and surrounding land uses. Um, so should staff be directed to move forward with this option, a work plan would need to be executed, including research benchmarking, the actual ordinance development and outreach to the stakeholders. Um, however, we do anticipate um, it could potentially um, make it into the next round of regular updates to the zoning ordinance um, at the end of the calendar year. Um, it just should be noted, though, however, that while a new permit requirement would allow the city to take enforce, enforcement action more readily through land use um, uh, provisions, it, any businesses operating um, when, once the ordinance go into effect may be considered legal nonconforming. So it really would apply to any new businesses going forward um, where that business would be required to get a permit. Okay, should the city council direct staff to adopt a program to regulate vape and smoke shops? Staff needs time to evaluate and develop a program scope, much like uh, Rachel said. Um, objectives, staffing, resources, budget, a timeline for implementation on a citywide scale in context um, of other city priorities and efforts. Um, staff anticipates um, resources and funding to support a new program would be incorporated into a future budget phase. In the meantime, the police department will continue to investigate complaints as resources and competing priorities allow. Um, code enforcement will also continue to conduct annual proactive inspections of the TRL businesses and regulatory compliance inspection of registered cannabis businesses. Staff will also continue to respond to complaints from the public regarding illegal cannabis activity and tobacco retailer operations and will continue to refer any criminal act activity observed to the police department for follow-up. Staff will continue to conduct youth decoy operations as able in alignment with current grant requirements, and staff will explore an amendment to the grant in coordination with the County of Santa Clara Public Health Department to expand the use of funds to allow partnership with the Police Department Explorer Cadet Program to serve as decoys and or use the funds for Police Department enforcement efforts. Um, should the City Council direct staff to explore the city-initiated zoning ordinance amendment, um, the steps that Rachel just mentioned will need to be taken. And so uh, with that, um, we are, our recommendation is to accept our report uh, as presented. Wonderful. Thank you so much for the report. We're going to see if there's any public comment before we go to the committee. There is no public comment. We do have one public comment. Honorable Chair, Sean Kelly rye Silicon Valley Cannabis Alliance uh, Council members. Uh, I was not going to speak to this issue, but I just couldn't sit back. Um, this item came up in October of 2023. Uh, six months have passed, and, and you just received a report that's seven pages in length. Yeah, a little more than a page a month. That doesn't give you any detailed plan. That doesn't give you any way to protect children. That's what we're talking about here. Fundamentally, we're talking about how you keep places that are not supposed to sell cannabis or illegal products out of the hands of ordinary citizens. I don't see any of that in this program here. Six months. Six months. That's a huge amount of time to come up with seven pages that tell you what they can and cannot do and that they need more time to do their job. I, I just don't understand the extremely slow pace of work here. We're asking the police department to enforce against illegal drug sales. Does the police department enforce against illegal drug sales or don't they? Fundamentally, that is the question. And how are you going to do that? And I don't know why they don't understand Council Member Jimenez's memo from October of, of 2023. It was quite clear to any layperson that, that let's look at how we're going to deal with this issue, not come back and ask for more funds and then have to deal with this issue. I mean, 
if the police department is saying they can't figure out how to enforce illegal drug sales from cannabis from vape shops smoke shops and so forth then that's a fair answer and then the council should accept that and then just concede the fact that illegal drug sales are going to happen in san jose and the police department has no ability to enforce that i'm just flabbergasted i just got to say as a member of the public as a person who's worked in san jose for a number of years as a former staff person i can't believe that it takes this long to come up with this this empty report and then it always comes to this correlation between we need fees thank you your time is up Thank you. We'll come back to the committee. I think I have a few folks that want to speak. Uh, Vice Mayor Kamei. Thank you. <clears throat> so one of the things that I'm, I'm wondering about, um, you know, in terms of how do we separate what is being done and what could be done in the future? Because I think that um, uh, there, is a, there is an issue in terms of, of the um, the vape and smoke shops potentially selling things that they're not supposed to be selling, um, and the danger to um, underage minor uh, students, kids, what have you. So I think I think that for the immediate thing, it seems to me that it's not like we're sitting on our hands. We are in the process of addressing these um, uh, uh, complaints. And it, it isn't clear here. I think that in, in, in what you have said, it, it, it isn't as clear saying, yes, in fact, anyone who reports to the PD, uh, we have a process, it is going through this process, and we will investigate, we will uh, uh, take action, and what have you. We have regulations already there. So I think that there's one pathway in terms of going on that pathway. And if there are those who are uh, consistent, uh, you know, where you're getting, I don't know how many complaints you get, but, you know, if you're getting numerous complaints about same location, same vendor, same whatever, then obviously it needs a deeper look. So I think that there are things that that um, can be done, have been done, um, that 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 is, is, is one track. The other track is whether or not the city council deems it necessary to uh, uh, implement a conditional use permit on these facilities that, you know, uh, prior were not as, as uh, um, an issue, but now uh, we deem it necessary because of its proximity or whatever it is. Uh, and I think, I think that, that we, we do these on parallel tracks, um, and, and, I, and I would say that you know, I have some parents who are very concerned uh, about, oh, well, what's happening in that smoke shop? I see, you know, that they're selling drugs. You know, what are you going to do if someone says, well, you know, you're supposed to report 911 and, you know, and, and any incidences? Um, they never hear a lot about what happens afterwards. They put in a complaint, and, and some people just say, well, you know, um, I'm being ignored. So I think we need we need clarity on what is actually happening and how it's being resolved and whether or not we have the resources to be able to address every call that comes in complaining about a, a vape shop. The other thing the other thing is that in terms of moving forward on conditional use, I think this is my own opinion, I think it's very valid. I think we need to find ways to uh, talk to those who are going to be affected and just do it. You know, I mean, maybe we'll learn something different along the way as we're uh, talking to individuals. And if it's a if it's a big enough problem, then you know, I think that we need to put the resources there necessary to investigate. You know, the pathway to do that. So, um, because if they're not supposed to be and they're competing with those who are doing the right thing, then we should do something. So I think that these parallel tracks, I think, need to be more clear. And I think that, you know, uh, bringing it to the city council would be uh, something that I think would be worthwhile because uh, we're going to keep hearing this again and again and again and again. And of course, we don't want it to get worse. We want to do something about it um, immediately. 
Thank you for that. And, and before I go to Councilmember Batra, I would just say that uh, the, the what we're doing, or actually before I go to Lee, he wants to say a few words, but before we do that, um, if one option is whoever makes the motion is to accept the report, the other one is to cross-reference it to a future council meeting. So that's an option as well. I'll leave that to whoever makes the motion. Uh, but Lee, I thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and I was also going to ask for a, a cross-reference to the full council because I, I think at a staff level we would be fine with direction uh, to come back um, with amendments in a CUP process if we could make that December timeline and and staff is not asking for money to do that work. Um, I do want to say um, I do not grade Rachel, Wendy, or or the deputy chief on the amount of pages they write per month. And if that was the case, they would have been here a while ago with a much more extensive report. What I have asked as this has come forward is, what is the best way for us to focus our limited resources on those that are doing illegal activity? And that has not been a regulatory um, tool. It has been an enforcement tool. Um, and I would just say, I would like everyone to understand, I do think it is hard to have a public policy conversation when we have existing operations um, and people in the field trying to close down some of these establishments. So there were drafts of this memo with plenty of pictures and details of those operations and I said please take them out. So I agree with you Vice Mayor. Um, it doesn't hurt to have the CUP approach. I personally think any tobacco um, establishment in the city should should have much more rigor. I will say though some of the businesses that we've been able to close, or I wouldn't even say businesses, some of the places um, that are selling this activity that we're hearing from Sean and his businesses on, which I do appreciate them sharing, um, they don't have a business license fee, let alone would they get a CUP. And so our regulatory tools at our disposal just seem insufficient to tackle that problem. And at the same point in time, with the amount of vacancies we have in patrol, we do need to prioritize work. I do think our new acting chief has prioritized this. I know the deputy chief has, um, but it is hard to have that conversation here um, and point to that work. But I do think as a team, we certainly don't think additional uh, regulations, CUP or additional hurdles around tobacco is a bad thing, but it is really about illegal selling of drugs in the city and i don't think the regulatory tools at our disposal could fight that as fast as enforcement um, but that's why because we're kind of in that and don't want to um, showcase some of that that's why a lot of that was stricken but i would say as an administration we do feel that as we get resources back um, and this is one of the categories that we are We've given PD more latitude on, on police overtime. If we've asked them to reduce overtime and focus on the most critical things, this is one of those allotted things. Um, but it is hard to say those things in a public setting. Um, not that those uh, businesses or establishments are watching these meetings per se, but I don't uh, ever want to uh, choreograph what future operations may lead to. Thank you, Lee. Appreciate it. We're going to go to Councilmember Batra. I, I think, uh, Leah, I really appreciate that extra explanation you provided. <clears throat> I think extra regulations can always be meaningful in some cases, but what is not clear at the moment, and I think a couple of points which Vice Mayor made, and I'm going to try rephrasing them. <clears throat> the one of the things that's not clear what and how much are we able to do it through enforcement? You don't need to detail it out. Just how we do the enforcement, what do you need from the residents, how to do the reporting, okay? If we could just clarify that here, that this is what we are able to do it with this process followed, like the reporting or mechanism, and then the community does not get the feedback, which <clears throat> is not only on just this matter, 
but I think the police department has a limitation of being able to provide that feedback. I discussed that with the chief and also with the Southern Division captain. There's some effort going on in their department to look into how to make that possible. So I'm gonna leave that alone at the moment. This is not gonna be the item get addressed here. But in general, there's a concern about not being able to get the feedback on the closure of the reports which are, or requests which are made. And there are too many of them to be reported back. So we will need to address them on a separate place. But right now, clarifying about what you are able to do and what is the mechanism public need to follow, that in itself will be helpful. And a secret step, which as you said, we should give the direction wherever you want appropriately for future work and not necessarily to overload them when they are short staffed and all that, okay? And one question I had was, you described some, if you notice this thing, please report at this particular spot or what. Can we, under the current authority, require these smoke shops to display that sign? If we can produce that sign, and f can we force them to, uh, or require them to post in their windows that if you notice any illegal activities about the cannabis or this or that, please call this thing. This is a notice to the public which they are required to display. I'll take the first uh, couple questions. If you don't mind, council member, then I'll, I'll leave the, sure. the last one for Rachel if she's able to answer that. But. Um, thank you for the for the questions. The the first question with regard to how do we kind of close the loop with citizens who make complaints, and it's an absolutely valid valid comment. Um, I will say that the vast majority of complaints that we get or tips that we get around narcotic sales in general, those tips are generally, and I would you know is roughly say probably 90% of the time anonymous, and so there's really no mechanism okay. to follow back up with them but not all the time. And so in those instances where a community member really does want follow-up, um, they absolutely can go through their divisional captain to say, hey, look, I, I made this report. I'd love to know what happened with it. And the captain is that mechanism to get them that, that closure. Um, and along those same lines, what we are currently looking at some technology, um, not just for this type of incident, yeah. but also for all of them, that will allow a, a, a more streamlined um, loop for people who call 911 to be updated on their cases. Yes. So when it gets transitioned to yeah. the Bureau of Investigations or when it gets transitioned to the District Attorney's Office, they're informed. So mm -hmm. we're looking at a couple different ways yeah. to make that a little bit tighter. Because we agree, we want to make, we want to make information as easily uh, attainable as possible. Um, with regard to how we conduct the current investigations, I don't want to get too much into tactics, but what I will tell you is because marijuana is legal to possess, it really comes down to the ability for the police department to prove the intent to sale or the actual sale of. Um, you can probably guess how we do that the majority of the time. I'm not going to go into tactics again, but it requires... Um, a significantly higher level of resources than a regular investigation might do. And what I mean by that is we don't have the ability to just have a single patrol officer or a, a pair of patrol officers go in and do these types of investigations. They require specialized units with specialized skills and it requires a lot of them. We do do them, we've done them with, with a great deal of success. Um, I wish we could investigate every single uh, complaint that we get. I'm not gonna sit here and tell you that we can or that right now, um, but we do, as we get significant investigations where we know that they're selling to, to minors, for instance, we jump on those as quickly as we can. I will also say that the a majority of our narcotics investigations right now, we're trying to focus on fentanyl enforcement because obviously the concerns around fentanyl are the deadly overdoses, and we're really trying to prioritize where we put our resources. Okay, thank you. No. You wanna comment on that? Uh... Sure. Whether we can require. Yes, um, so just to, to add, um, code enforcement does um, c circle back with the complaining party at the closure of the case, um, and they can also get status updates at any time if they call and request that status update. 
or if we are able to proactively, pro proactively provide that update. So just to give you some um, information around code enforcement's customer service process. Um, and then as far as the signage, um, the, the tobacco retail license program does require they post like their, you know, the copy of their permit and things like that. I know there's some, some signage that's required at the state level for that type of um, product sale, but as far as something we could require as um, to report, we, we could consider that and um, if we move forward with an ordinance amendment for the conditional use permit or if um, some of the work that's already, we have direction to do for the tobacco retail license amendment coming later this year, so we can explore to see if that's something that's possible um, to include. Okay. All right, we'll go back to Vice Mayor Kamei. Yeah. I, I'd like to move the item, that we accept the item, and uh, cross-reference it to City Council. Okay, motion is second. Uh, I just have some questions. I'll be supporting that. I think it's important to bring it to the floor, everyone. Um, you know, I, I'll be honest with you. I'm still trying to wrap my head around sort of the, the mechanics of the enforcement of some of this. And so um, what I'm curious about is, and I'm gonna make a statement, it's sort of a question, but you let me know if it's accurate. So so if a tobacco so a tobacco retail license, that's that's a license that vape shops have to have and other type of smoke shops have to have, right? Is that or or anyone that sells tobacco, whether it be cigarettes at a gas station, whatever it may be. It's only required if you sell tobacco products. Okay. Any type of tobacco product. Just Yes. Whatever. Okay. Okay. So, so anyone that sells tobacco needs to have a tobacco retail license. And so if, if I own a tobacco retail license, have a tobacco retail license and I sell tobacco, um, and I am caught selling cannabis there, I'm not in violation of the TRL license, but I'm in violation of a criminal, it's a criminal act at that point. There are muni code regulations that are administrative or civil, but there is obviously criminal. But it's you're correct in that it's not part of the tobacco retail license ordinance. It's separate. Okay. All right. Um, okay. And then so, because I was also trying to understand the distinction between you know, because I think just reading the report um, that some some. Let's see, I'm gonna, I'm gonna see if I find it. Code enforcement and police department staff investigate as resources and competing priorities allow, which is totally understandable. Um, it says it's important to note that each department much in, must inspect and enforce within the bounds of its authority, which I understand. Code enforcement addressing administrative violations and police department addressing criminal activity. Um, so if, if, if I know of a tobacco uh, of a place that sells tobacco that has a TRL and I say I call I, I figure out okay they're selling tobacco I mean sorry they're selling cannabis or mushroom whatever right something illegal I as a resident do I call the police or do I reach out to code enforcement it's probably a silly question but I'm trying to understand the mechanics no of it's it. a completely fair question um, so so we're working in partnership so if PD receives a call about a business that's having criminal activity and they know it would also fall into our shop they're going to let us know and, and vice conversely so i i would encourage them to report either avenue i, but, I guess probably priority would be police but i guess i'm trying to understand how that falls under code enforcement if it's a legal and it's, it's an illegal sale at the trl shop even though it's not a violation of the trl license does that make sense i'm trying to yeah i understand I and, and you're getting into the gray that is code <laughs> enforcement right so so i definitely think the first priority would be pol the police in that regard that reporting to the police is the most important thing to do right and then depending on what's occurring at that location it could end up being something that code also has to address under cannabis regulations of the municipal code that are administrative if that makes sense okay sort of but we'll go back. Go ahead. I don't know if you have it. Yeah, it is a difficult question to answer. Um, and so I guess probably the best way I would describe it is there's multiple venues that could be approached, right? So you could you could attack the problem from an administrative perspective where you're you're going through code enforcement and they're going in and they're issuing admin citations for the violations of the TRL. But there is also a criminal enforcement investigation on the sale of marijuana specifically. Um, and those two investigations can happen simultaneously, parallel, but very independent of right. each other. And so that investigation of the sale of marijuana at a, uh, at a, at a let's just say a, a smoke shop, that is because they are, they are not 
one of the 16 authorized retailers of marijuana, correct? That's correct. Therefore, it's a, it's a criminal act, it's illegal, right? Correct. Okay, all right. Um, so as it relates, to, so, so as an example, if I call both, pol you know, let's just say I call code enforcement, that exact example, yeah, I think this dude on the corner is selling cannabis out of his smoke shop. He's not one of the 16. And I call uh, code enforcement, what, what do you all do at that point? Uh, Tara, it's probably itching to jump in on this. But, um. I, and the, and the reason I'm asking is I'm yeah. trying to understand the mechanics of yeah. this, right? Because I think that's where it gets a little convoluted, and I have trouble yeah. so, understanding. So there's varying degrees of what we find, right? We might find a smoke shop that's selling, you know, some cannabis products that have THC, but they may not they may not meet the definition of a flu, full blown dispensary under the municipal code. And so that's something that would probably very much end up in the you know, only in the shop of, of the police department. But if they if they were an unregistered uh, collective selling marijuana as a dispensary type use, PD would address it as well as code enforcement because we can do a compliance order about the them not having the the license to or excuse me the registration to to dispense marijuana in our city. So it just really it depends. It's a case by case, and we have to understand what's occurring at the property and have evidence to support that, and then it helps us decide which way we need to go. All right. So 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 how about this? If 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 there was so, if you hear from the full council, this is an issue we want to stop. We want to stop the unauthorized sale. And I know the TRL, you know, selling tobacco to youth. Obviously, that's a component we care about as well. But if we say we want to stop the unauthorized sale of cannabis at these locations, it's undercutting the potential tax revenue from the 16 authorized vendors or the sellers. If I ask, and I'll ask you, I guess, what is the best way to do that? <laughs> so. If, if I knew the answer, council member, I, I think, uh, I, mean, I wish we could stop all dr illegal drug sales right. citywide. And, and it's something that we've, every right. agency struggles with trying right. to do. Um, the way to do it is through criminal enforcement, right? And how much criminal enforcement we're actually able to do becomes a bandwidth issue, becomes a staffing right. issue. Which, which so, makes sense to me. Yeah, I, I, think, I think getting back to the, to the original kind of direction that, that that we were given was to look at whether or not this enforcement action or regulatory action could be done in the division of cannabis regulation. I think that's kind of why we're here to talk about. And the answer to that, the really short answer to that is really that's not the, the, the place where that's this it. type of enforcement lives. Where this type of enforcement lives is within the Bureau of Field Operations and the police department and the criminal enforcement in conjunction with the district attorney's office and the prosecution part of it. Um, and, and we're doing it to the very best level that we possibly can. But again, everything comes down to staffing and bandwidth and a prioritization of our resources. Right, I understand. Um, go ahead, Lee. And, you and I would just say, as the, as the team has presented different ideas to me, I, I've landed on the same exact spot, is what type of funding mechanism or do we come forward and say, as part of the budget process, approve four new positions in the police department to only focus on this because it's more of a general fund thing. If we collect, you know, fees from the current dispensaries, that, that money actually has to be spent on regulating the dispensaries. And even the tobacco um, route, it has to be enforced for those ones that are actually paying versus this is just illegal activity. And for me, trying to think of, uh, you know, solutions that would work more immediately it's been around trying to give uh, priorities to the police department around the use of overtime or investigations that involve children or a lot of these operations. It's not just marijuana. It is much stronger drugs, as, as the deputy chief has said, so to prioritize those. But even the addition of positions with the number of vacancies we have, we still haven't been able to fill necessarily the walking beats that we did two years ago in the budget and a variety of things. So it, it, unfortunately, with the position we're in, the, the focus is unfortunately, I would say, on the edges of what we would like, but I would agree with the deputy chief. It, I do think the enforcement route is the thing that actually moves the needle here. Okay, and and the other question I had is, so it changes to Title 20, right, a CUP. Is, was that mentioned because that that is, that's a way to, because I'm trying to understand sort of the, the what that would give us that we don't already have, right? So that, that would affect, broaden our, code its ability to go out and force some of this is that a well it definitely adds a tool to the toolbox that isn't already there um you can think of it kind of like how we approach our off-sell alcohol currently where 
you know, if, if this type of business um, wants to operate in our city, they're going to have to do that um, not only by obtaining a permit, but it'll have conditions that they have to adhere to. So yes, it would give us a way to condition the use and then code enforcement ha would have kind of like a, um, you know, a framework to work within if, if they're operating outside of those conditions. Um, it just kind of raises the bar for those, right. those businesses to operate. But currently there are, I mean, conditions tied to the TRL that they need to abide by now. I mean, well, so again, the tier, not every vape and smoke shop is a TRL business if they don't sell the tobacco. So um, a vape and smoke shop, and again, the TRL only regulates the tobacco sale portion. So there's still a land use under our zoning ordinance and a, a vape and smoke shops can consider a permitted retail use in most zoning districts. Okay, yeah. all right. And so, and so, for example, if a, uh, a vape and if if uh, a business that's selling tobacco, obviously they need to apply, obtain a TRL. Mm -hmm. They're found to be, let's just say, selling cannabis. Do we revoke that TRL at that point, or it's not? It's not. We don't necessarily tie the two together and say, "Oh, you did this illegal act," and and therefore now we're going to revoke your TRL, and you probably need to close. Or I mean. He has it, as it's currently written, we're, uh, the ordinance, we're referring it over to the police department. Okay, so you wouldn't just say, you're doing something illegal, you need to close, or? <laughs> yeah, and normally, I mean, we'll have to take a look at that part of the code, but the, but currently, it, it's, it's you're only in violation if you're not operating, for the TRL portion, if you're not operating in accordance with the TRL ordinance. There are other parts of the code that say you have to follow all state, local, and federal regulations, so. So because it's a criminal activity, we refer that to the police department for yeah. follow-up. And there, there's no way to broaden the language of the TRL, uh, what falls under, what's governed and, and, and sort of regulated under the TRL ordinance, say anything you can hail. I mean, I'm yeah. just making this up, right? But yeah. to broaden it so that way it captures so currently it is a fee-for-service program, so similar to the Department of um, Cannabis Regulation, or Division of Cannabis Regulation. Um, we are limited to enforce only on tobacco retail licensed businesses and that is that component of that. Um, you know, yeah, the ordinance can be amended to include anything if, count, if we council yeah. decides to do so, but. Well, we devise those rules, right? We, we're the ones that decide whether we want it to include that or not include this. And no, that, that's absolutely true, and without speaking for the city attorney, um, <laughs> which would be nice. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I do think if we're going to look at the CUP, we yeah. could obviously can look at our own ordinance around the, the TLR and maybe make it more administratively easy to state that there, if there's proof of illegal activity, that we have the ability to close it immediately for a period of days or something. Um, so those everyone, are things that we could absolutely yeah. look at. I also think, too, um, it wouldn't hit all of them because there are, a, I was surprised as well, a lot of a smoke and vape shops that don't sell tobacco, that don't fall within this. Um, but we could send out something. I think we have about 700 businesses that have these in the city or, or thereabouts. Something proactively in the way of communication that we're looking at these changes. But in the interim, um, if any evidence is, is found otherwise, that they will be handled criminally in the future, just to maybe curtail some of it. Um, again, some of the ones that we've been able to actually stop and bust I, aren't ones that have tobacco license, let alone business permits, though. So I don't think it would solve all of it, but it certainly could help. Yeah, okay. And just under the media code in general, there's there's if you have enough evidence to support it, there's always the ability to go through a nuisance lawsuit through the city attorney's office on any property. So it doesn't necessarily mean it needs to be incorporated into the TRL ordinance if the case is substantial enough to, to move forward in that direction. Okay, all right. And then just thank you for that. Uh, the very last question is tied to just the, I found it interesting. I didn't know we were doing, I think you guys call them decoys, uh, sending in, I guess, fake youth or people that look young like Lee to go buy cigarettes and, 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 and things of that nature. And then obviously catch these folks in the act. What I'm curious about, it seems like we're not currently not working, utilizing that program because we can't find enough decoys. I would just say that we have a youth commission that's always working on a lot of different things. They're very active kids. And so I think it'd be worth sort of plugging in with them and seeing if they can try to go, get some friends together to provide the, the decoys uh, necessary to go out and do some of this work. I think some of that's important and that's sort of an easy thing to do, I think, but uh, just wanted to put that out there.
I was going to recommend Lucas, oddly enough. Lucas, yeah. That we'll sell, we'll sell Lucas for a um, You know, I think what the administration can commit to as well, and, and again, this was more me than the police department or code enforcement here is um, we'll cross-reference and just bring the memo forward. But when we do the presentation, I can certainly have PD or, you know, be more open to here's what we've been able to do in the last two years around some of these and not go into any tactics whatsoever, but for the chief to give a little idea of just how much it takes. And that's not as an excuse, but it is a rationale for the, the council to better understand why they do prioritize the ones that involve youth or the ones that aren't just marijuana, but um, possible other drugs as well, so that you guys better have that um, information. Okay. All right. Uh, council, that's all for me. Council Member Dwan has a question. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, staff, for the report. My, my understanding that the decoy program, you guys are working with Santa Clara County, am I correct? They're administering the grant on the behalf of the Department of Justice, so yes. And do they provide some funding for us to, to hire decoys? So the um, the grant was awarded. We're in this. We're about two and a half years in of a three-year grant. And when it was created, it was is actually created to support our efforts um, to enforce on illegal sales to minors, especially related to the flavored tobacco problem that we had been having previously. So the the grant money is actually used. Um, we identify in the grant ahead of time to be used for staff overtime and other costs. The youth um, decoys are provided. Um, it's also stipulated in the grant that they have to be provided by Brief California. So we are um, looking at opening conversations with the county to see if that can somehow be amended so that we can look at other opportunities to obtain decoys from other um, entities. Thank you. And then in the city of San Jose, we have 580 TRL. Um, Yes, the number fluctuates. I think the last time I checked, it was at just about 590. 590. Do, do we have a limitation to, to the amount of TRL? We do not. However, with our last amendment to the ordinance, we did put into place um, distance requirements. So they're, they're prohibited from being located certain distances from schools, daycare centers, other use sensitive receptors in the city. So that is really narrowed down. Um, and also proximity to one another. So that's narrowed down the ability for new businesses to open. Uh, thank you, and on page three, there, and then in, in the memorandum, it stated when a business is found to be selling tobacco products without a TRL, staff proceed with enforcement to ensure either a license is obtained, if eligible, or the business sees tobacco product sales. I, I've kind of, I, I think that that almost like being really lenient because first of all you're operating with a license and then we give you an opportunity I think we just shut them down and once and for all and and said no you're, you're not going to ever try to get another license in the city of San Jose because you're operating technically illegally um, and and we run to we run into a lot of problem out there that we penalize all the businesses that pay enormous amount of taxes and permit to operate. But yet we have a lot of vendors out there operating illegally without permits. From flowers to tobaccos, you name it, from hot dogs vendor. How do we enforce that? Because I'm, I'm telling you right now, businesses are going out of business because they can't compete with illegal vendors. They, they, they cannot continue to operate when there's, let's say you have a shop selling flowers, and then you have five or six, maybe even 10 people surrounding the area selling flowers without any permit. And therefore, I, I, businesses have, have told me that their sale have gone down 50, 60 percent, and they're at the edge of going out of business. And so if we don't do anything about it, the city, number one, will, will never have enough, will at least incur 
take in enough taxes to provide all the services. Two, if illegal vendors like hot dogs, what, what happened when, when a vendor without legal permit caused a bunch of people to be sick? Who's going to be responsible for that? Who are we hold the standard to? And, and, and that's a bigger problem that I, I see out there, and I, I get complaints from small businesses to large businesses. How do we come up with a plan to apply the existing law that we have? So there's a couple strategies that we take with regards to the tobacco retail license um, permit requirement, um, or it's actually license, not a permit. So the license requirement, so every year um, they do the annual renewal, we, we reconcile our list with the state because they're also required to get a state license. So anyone that's on that list that's not on our business list, we, we do proactive outreach to say, hey, you need to get a, a license within this amount of time, otherwise you're gonna be restricted to continue to operate. Um, and we also, if we observe a business um, that we see is selling tobacco products or we get a report of a business selling tobacco products that doesn't have a TRL license, then we open a code enforcement case on that and do our, go through our enforcement process as appropriate. Um, I'd say most of the time if we encounter a business um, selling without um, a license, you know, there's a lot of different scenarios, but um, we will give them a very short time frame if they're even eligible. We're finding that a lot of businesses now aren't even eligible due to the new ordinance changes. Um, but, you know, we can't deny a business uh, a right to pursue the um, the license if they are eligible, but but we can definitely require them to stop the sale of those products until such time that they receive that license. Um, and then, of course, if they aren't eligible, they can't operate at all in that fashion. So we, we go through our enforcement process to, to ensure that, you know, we're holding all those businesses to the regulations that are required. And we have um, denied applications. We have, um, you know, people have stopped, you know, ceased to sell tobacco. We've had a lot of, um, of different scenarios that have been successful, so. So with the fiscal year 2022 and 23, how many shop have we shut down because they illegal sell of marijuana or other products? I don't have that data with me, but I can get that data for you. All right, well, thank you very much, and um, continue with the good work, and I yield my time. Thank you, I think the uh, very last thing is Councilman about that I had a comment he wanted to make, and then we'll <coughs> You said that you can put the notice or require them to put the notice on with your current authority and license requirements, right? Uh, that if you notice any illegal activity, or please report it the following way. So that was the, um, the comment you had asked about earlier that I mentioned. We would look at that through our next ordinance uh, amendments. Oh, to see if so we can include it, yeah. So, so you're going to look into it if yes. you can, and, and hopefully it doesn't require you to get any additional authority to do that, and we get that sooner out there. I think it will act as a deterrent for some, and uh, it would be out whatever reduction we can achieve. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think we've exhausted all the questions, so we look forward to seeing you at the full city council. Um, we'll go ahead and vote. All right, that's unanimous. Uh, thank you, we're at the end of the meeting. Uh, open forum, any comments from anyone from the public? There is no public Seeing comment. none, okay, we're gonna adjourn the meeting. Thank you everyone, have a nice day.